You know what I'm going to do? Let's, let's continue on with what we were uh, discussing this morning. Make sure we're on and everything like that. Um, and just kind of deal with this issue of God proving who is a Christian and who isn't a Christian. Now, we, we like to judge people and say uh, that they don't look, they don't act like a Christian. They don't look like a Christian. I watch goofy videos all the time of people ranting and raving. I don't know if you know what the word Karen means. Some of you do. And I don't know where it came from, but apparently a Karen is someone who thinks she's better than everybody else and she has to inject herself in everybody's business and she yells and screams to get her way. Sometimes she curses a lot to get her way, so on and so on and so on. And um, where was I going with that? I forgot where I was going with that. Anyway, huh? Yeah. And a lot of times these people say, well, I'm a Christian. And I'm just going, I hate it when they say that. I hate it when they say that. Lisa and I got scammed one time by uh, a lady calling saying that we had won the Publishers Clearinghouse sweepstakes. So Lisa had just actually filled it out. And um, so they told us to get in the car and drive to the nearest store or whatever. And by the time we got to the parking lot, I'm going, uh, no, uh-uh. When she said that we had to go in and buy these gift cards, and I went, no, no, this is a scam. And she had sort of like a Caribbean accent. And I said, ma'am, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. I said, I'm a pastor of a church, and me and my wife, and here we're laboring in our church working the work of the Lord. You call us to scam us to get money. And I said, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Well, I'm not ashamed of myself. I am a Christian too. And, I, and I'm just going, oh, good grief. A lot of people believe that they're saved. Not every, Jesus said, not, not everyone who cries unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. And so when it comes down to it, God always tests and he proves and he is going to show you whether or not you're saved. He's going to show the world whether or not you're saved. And he's going to make it clear that you're playing on the wrong team. Somebody say amen. So we read Deuteronomy 8. Let's read that again very quickly. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall you observe to do that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. And, uh, you know, isn't it interesting that the proof that God gives is centered upon His Word by saying all the commandments which I give thee this day. Do you really hold to the Word of God in your life? If this lady really was a Christian, she would not be employed scamming people out of multi-thousands of dollars, knowing that she's scamming them. These people in these call centers, no matter where they are, from India or wherever, they know what they're doing is wrong. And it's even illegal in India to run a call center like that. And if that company has not bribed all the police, then they can be arrested. And there's pictures and videos of them arresting an entire, like 40, 50 people all at once being arrested for being scammers. And uh, so anyway, but it centers on his word. In verse 2, he said, Thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. Father, we ask your blessings now upon your word.
We ask, Father, Lord, that you open up our eyes and our minds and our hearts. Father, prove us. Try me. Prove me. Test me. So that, Father, that I know if I'm saved. That my family knows if I'm saved because... God, I would hate to deceive my family into thinking that I was Mr. Righteousness when I wasn't. And Father, prove me, Lord, for the sake of this church and the sake of the ministry that you've given us. Father, so that these people that see us online, see me online, Lord, that they know whether or not I'm actually following you and leading them in the right way instead of misleading them. I would hate that too. So Father, prove me and then prove us, Lord, as a church so that we know that we're following you and doing what's right. Bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said... Amen. I went to uh, 1 Peter. Uh, we read one verse out of there. Uh, go back there again. And there's another verse. Um, Hebrews, James, 1 Peter, 2 Peter. We need to sing that song more. 3 John, Jude, and Revelation. So everybody knows the books of the Bible. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 said it's a fiery trial. In verse 6, wherein you, uh, you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth. And that's something that I, I know for a fact God has tested me on more than once. Mike, are you more interested in money or are you interested in speaking the truth? Because if you speak the truth, you're probably not going to get as big a crowd either in your church or online as those who lie. And, and I'm saying those who lie about Bible prophecy, those who lie about conspiracies in the world. The liars always seem to get a lot more video hits than I do. And I don't understand. I do not understand how a guy... Now, I to do a Watchman broadcast takes a little setup time. Set the camera up, set the recording, way I'm going to record it set up, get the microphones hooked up, get them connected together, get all the lights set, turned on, how they should be, work on notes for weeks, maybe even months of work going into a Watchmen or a series of Watchmen broadcasts, sit down, go through the recording, make a few mistakes, take the recording, take it to one of my computers, put it in the video editing, edit the mistakes out, add the background, do some things with the sound so it sounds good, Mix in the beginning music, the ending music, the beginning and ending graphics, do the rendering. Then, once that's done, upload it to YouTube, convert it two different ways to upload it to Sermon Audio, and that's all it takes. And then some guy who's got a camera sitting in his car talking about how flat the earth is for 15 minutes with no script, no nothing, no brain, and he's got 50,000 views. And I'm just going, I don't get it. I don't get it. So, oh well, it's, I guarantee it's not a popularity contest. The trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire. And I want you to underline that in your Bible because it is going to be with fire. Oh good, I've achieved something. My watch said 
I had a perfect week. I don't know what that means. But anyway, it will be of fire. Might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So, the Bible is very clear telling you that a fiery trial is going to take place before Christ appears. Not after. This is going to happen before. So 1 Peter chapter 4. Turn there. First Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. There he says it again. As though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Two times now, that's doctrine. That is a doctrine foundation. Out of the mouth of two witnesses or three, let every word be established. If I'm going to believe a doctrine, it has to be mentioned twice in the Bible, and it has to be very clear. Two times in the same book, Peter says that a fiery trial is going to take place. And he tells us here in verse 12, don't think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. But then, and then he again mentions in verse 13 that it is going to happen when his glory shall be revealed. So both times telling you it's going to happen before the rapture, both times it's, it's telling you that it's going to be a fiery trial. Now, here's what I think. Is going to happen. You remember the story of Lot, and we have the four cities Sodom, Gomorrah, Zeboim, and Adma, I believe, is the four. They are a prophetic type because what was it that fell down from heaven? Fire. Fire and brimstone. Now, what are angels made of? Fire. That is their substance. We're made of carbon. They're made of fire. That's, that, that means they, they're literally light. Okay? The serpents that came and bit the Israelites... In the book of Numbers, because they murmured against God, were fiery serpents, meaning that they were devils, they were spirits. Um, the horse and carriage chariot that came to pick up Elijah was made of what? Fire. It was a fiery horse and a fiery chariot. With Elisha, when his servant I think it was Eliezer, looked around and he saw that they were surrounded by all these chariots. And he said, hey, don't worry about it. There's more with us than there is with them. And he's going, what are you, nuts? Lord, open his eyes and he may see. And he looks and up on all the hills surrounding them were chariots of fire and horses of fire surrounding them. All. They were, those were angels. So now Revelation 12 uh, Revelation 6, the opening of the sixth seal, God's going to shake heaven. And when he shakes heaven, fire, literally fire, is going to fall from heaven. Isn't that the sign that the false prophet does to convince everybody that he is some big guy that knows the future and he can command fire to fall down from heaven? And it does. Maybe those things are related. That he makes the call for this fire to come down from heaven and God kicks out a third of the fiery angels and they fall to the earth. And that, my friends, could very well be our fiery trial, which is to try us all. Did it affect Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Not even, not even close. So if that is any type of 
prophetic typology or related to that whatsoever, we have absolutely nothing to worry about. God is going to keep us safe. But it's going to be a trial in that I believe that God is going to give everybody in this world one last opportunity to choose. Who's on the Lord's side? Who isn't? And I think a lot, well, I think every phony Christian is going to choose the wrong side. And the fire will fall. And they will perish at that. You and I will be taken up, I believe. But they will perish. Uh, turn to Genesis chapter 6. We have a prophetic picture of this. A type. It's the first time I believe that the 40 days are mentioned. In verse 17, God said, And behold, I, even I, I like it when God says that. I, even I, that to me is like me and nobody else but me. I, even I to bring a flood of waters upon the earth. Now we have a promise. And uh, the one rain that we got while we were in Colorado, see, it seems to be very dry out there. The one rainstorm we got in Colorado, we were driving out and, we, and it just happened to be a double, I love those double rainbows. Because to me that's like, God speaketh once, God speaketh twice. That's his promise of the first coming, promise of the second coming. At least he got pictures of them. I love them. But what did that rainbow pronounce? It pronounced, a, it was a sign saying that God would no longer destroy the earth with water. So he won't. What's he going to destroy it with? Fire. Okay. I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life from under heaven. And everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy son's wives with thee. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female See, God even knew how to save the animals, didn't he? And not the transgendered ones. Okay? <laughs> Male and female. Of fowls after their kind and of cattle after their kind. Of every creeping thing. Um, uh, of the earth after his kind. Two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. And take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten and thou shalt gather it to thee. And it shall be for food for thee and for them. Thus did know according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Why? Because it was going to rain for how long? Forty days and forty nights. Uh, let's see here. I, apparently I didn't have that. Uh, anyway, Genesis 7 if you look there, in, starting in verse, verse 11, verse 12, the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Now, uh, Hebrews 11, that what we call the Faith Hall of Fame, says that Noah was saved by that ark. And some want to say, well, that's work salvation because he had to work to build the ark. Yes, but he wouldn't have built the ark if he didn't believe what God was saying. He believed what God was saying. And so 
you have four men, Noah and his three sons, who, who basically provide salvation for not just his family, but for all the seed of all the living creatures that were upon the face of the earth. He saved all of them by means of those four men. And that's a picture of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the gospel. And here's the ark. The ark is Christ. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The 40 days, of course, they represent salvation, but they also represent that time of, of testing and trial and probation. And, and Noah had a choice. Do I take the easy route where I don't have to build this humongous boat along with everything else I have to do? I mean, my goodness, I'm 500 years old. Then, or do I believe what God said? And the proof that Noah was who he said he was was the fact that at the end of the 40 days, he's still alive on that ark. Him, his wife, his sons, their wives. And if you believe, uh, who is it, Russell Crowe, there was another guy hiding in the ark. Did you see that version of it? It made me mad. All it down, Now, I like the rock guys. But that's not who the giants were, okay? But the proof of it was Noah was who he said he was because you and I exist now. We are the seed of Noah, okay? Now, Exodus 16. Look at this. What other proof? Shows that you are a person of faith. You are faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. You believe what God said. And you believe that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So Exodus 16, 35, and the children of Israel did eat manna 40 years until they came to a land inhabited and they did eat manna until they came into the borders of the land of Canaan. And if you want to know where, uh, turn to Joshua. Uh, I think it's Joshua chapter 6, I believe. It's been a while since I read this. Um, <clears throat> but God... Uh, told them, I think it was in Joshua 6, that the manna was going to stop. Now that they're ready to take the very first city of the promised land, which is in Jericho, the manna's going to stop. God's going to stop feeding them manna. And what ha is going to happen is they're going to start they're going to go in Jericho and steal all the food that they've got in there. And that's how their God's going to feed them with regular, normal human food. Once they take Jericho, some of the people are going to settle in Jericho and live there. Raise their cattle, grow their crops, their tomatoes or whatever it is. And they're going to live in that city and they're going to live off of the land. So God stops feeding them. But... Basically, the 40 years of the manna was, do they trust God enough to eat the manna? And you remember, at one point, they complained, and God sent fiery serpents. Another time, they said, we want flesh, we want meat. Something with blood in it. Something with that'll mm, taste good. So God sent them, what, quails? And I love that. The Bible says it came out their nose. They ate so much that it was just 
overflowing out of their nose. Pu they were puking quail right out their snout. Okay? But the test in this case is, are you a Christian? Do you believe God? Are you born again? And if you do, you'll eat manna for 40 days. And if you can eat manna and live on that, that shows what you believe, that you believe the right thing. Numbers chapter 14. Turn there. Numbers 14. Verse 26. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, How long should I bear with this evil congregation, which murmur against me? You remember, God took, he specifically picked the 12 men that he wanted. And he said, Moses, take those 12 men, the elders of each tribe. Give them enough victuals or whatever for what they need and send them in to Canaan to inspect the land to see whether it's good, like I said, or it's not or whatever. And when they come back and give their report, then we'll take it from there. God, of course, knew what was going to happen. The Lord spoke against Moses, uh, spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation, which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, which they murmur against me, say unto them, As surely as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me, doubtless ye shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. And I want you to get a hold of that now. Out of the some 600 thousand people that walked out of Egypt walked across dry ground through the middle of the Red Sea saw God's presence on Mount Sinai was given the Ten Commandments out of those 600 some odd thousand people only two of them made it from Egypt to Jericho. Only two. Now, all of the children that were under the age of 20, and then, of course, all the children who um, were born during the 40 years, they got to go in. And I always saw that as like the old man can't go, but the new man can. Okay? And there's also another principle in here. A lady told me uh, back at camp, she was telling me, well, I'm going to go ahead and say it. She was telling me about her experiences with UFOs. And she said, that happened a lot when she was young. She was an experiencer. But she said, when I turned 20 years old, I got involved with somebody and I started going to church and I got saved. And she said, it stopped right then. And I knew she was telling the truth. Now she said, now at that time, the church I was going to was an NIV church. And she said, she asked me, she said, was I saved? I said, keep telling me your story. She said, after a while, unfortunately, she got involved in drugs, had been arrested a few times. DFS took her kids away from her. She went through a really bad time. 
in her life, but at some point she got, uh, where was she going, Oak Lane? She started going to Oak Lane, uh, Brother Lonnie Burks, and then Pastor Mike Hutzel now. And she said, now I'm James Bible, I love your ministry, I watch everything you do. And I said, bingo. I said, here's what happened. And this is why I tell people, don't judge people who are using other Bibles right now. You don't know what God's going to do. Let's look at her life in particular. God used Moses to get her out of Egypt. But Joshua into the promised land. Oh, I see it with you. God did use this church and those people to lead you out of Egypt. But because of God's love for you, just like it was for me, God used Joshua you and he's going to lead you all into the promised land. He said, they don't mess with me anymore. That tells you right there what nature they are. These are devils. And this is the game that they play for whatever reason. This is the game that they play. Okay? Um, and he said, verse 31, But your little ones, which you said should be a prey, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which you have despised. But as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in this wilderness and your children shall wander in the wilderness 40 years and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness after the number of the days in which you know what you know what can get somebody more than anything them realizing just how much their sin god lays on their children in other words your own sin will have an effect on your family. How many children grow up in busted up homes where dad's a drunk and a whoremonger? Mom, in order to deal with that, is into drugs. What are those kids? They have to suffer all that. They have to bear that. So he said in verse... Um, 34, after the number of the days in which you search the land, even 40 days, each day for a year, shall you bear your iniquities, even 40 years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. And I, the Lord, I have said, I will surely do unto you, unto all this evil congregation that are gathered together against me in this wilderness. They shall be consumed, and there they shall die. And the men which Moses sent to search the land, who returned and made all the congregation to murmur against him, by bringing up a slander upon the land, even those men that did bring up the evil report upon the land died by the plague before the Lord. In other words, the ten, what's the ten? It's the law. Law tells you you're not going to heaven. Law tells you you can't make it into the promised land. And those ten men died of a plague because they slandered the land and they lied against the Lord. Only Joshua and Caleb told the truth and said, we could walk right in there right now and they can't touch us. It would have been the most glorious thing that those people had ever seen. But it was the 40 days those men were searching out that land. That was their probation. And when they came back, do you see it now? How these people, God's people, who just, let's back up now for a minute. They saw the ten plagues that God had. In, they saw in Egypt where it was total darkness during the day and in Goshen it was broad daylight. How does that happen? They saw flies all in Egypt, but in Goshen there wasn't a single fly. How does that happen? Hail and fire and Coming down from heaven in Egypt, but not one drop in Goshen. That's all, all of that. 
They saw them being trapped at the Red Sea. God opening up the sea. Them walking on dry ground. Getting over to Mount Sinai. Seeing the presence of God. Hearing the trumpet of God. Hearing the voice of God. The mountain on fire. Moses coming down both times with the law. His face shining as the sun. They see these miracles. Moses striking a rock and water coming out of it. They see all of this stuff. And after 40 days, these guys come back and say, we can't go in there. And they go, oh, my goodness. Oh, we can't go in there. They're fake. They're fake. Now, here's, here's the difference between you and them, Chris. Just you, not anybody else, just you. You didn't see God, or you didn't see me ever strike a rock and water come out. You haven't seen a river part and see dry ground that you walked on. You haven't seen where in one half of your house it was complete daylight and in the other half it was just completely dark. You've never seen that. You haven't seen those miracles. You have seen nothing of those things. All you did was read about them in your Bible. Do you believe them? We accept that these stories are real and we never saw them. We're believing the record that dates back 4,000 years ago. We believe what was written 4,000 years ago. We believe that these stories happen. That's faith. That's faith. One of these days, people, that faith is going to be tested in such a way as you never thought possible. I couldn't tell you. I don't know what it is. But if you don't believe this book now, I'd work on it. Deuteronomy 9.24 You have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. Thus I fell down before the Lord forty days and forty nights. As I fell down at the first, this is Moses at Mount Sinai. Because the Lord had said he would destroy you, I prayed therefore unto the Lord. And so, O Lord God, destroy not thy people and thine inheritance, which thou hast redeemed through thy greatness, which thou hast brought forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Remember this, thy servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Look not unto the stubbornness of this people, nor to their wickedness, nor to their sin, lest the land whence thou brought us out uh, say, because the Lord was not able to bring them into the land which he promised them, and because he hated them, and he hath brought them out to slay them in the wilderness. Yet they are thy people and thine inheritance which thou broughtest out by thy mighty power and by thy stretched out arm. You say, what does that have to do with anything, Mike? Moses spent 40 days praying that God would not destroy Israel. He'd been up in the mountain 40 days already came down with the two tables in his hand. They were breaking them. He smashed them on the ground. He had to go back up. And how does he spend the next 40 days? He spends the 40 days praying. God, don't kill your people. Moses. His test was trusting God that he would be a merciful God. And he was. He was a merciful God. Jonah. Chapter 3. The word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time saying, Arise, go into Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose. This is after he's been puked by the whale. Can you imagine J.R. being in a whale's belly for three days? Being vomited out, you end up on the beach. There's a guy fishing. And he sees this whale going, Bleh! and a guy comes out. And then he sees the guy stand up. And he's got like seaweed in his hair. 
and like fish guts on his clothes. And he walks up to the guy and he's going, which way is Nineveh? <laughs> the guy's like, that way? Uh, thank you. Goes to Nineveh. And he says, repent. I'd repent. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days journey. It means it took, that's big. Took three days to walk through Nineveh. How, how long can a man walk in a day? Does anybody know? Look it up. Somebody look that up. I don't mean look up at the ceiling because it's not there. I mean look it up. How, how far can a man walk in a day? What? 20 miles? What do you think? Anyway, you keep looking that up. Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey and he cried and said, Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. 40 days. And what did Nineveh do? So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. Yes. Oh! <laughs> I am hot, man. 20 miles to 30 miles. So 60, 80. Man, that's a big city. But 40 days, Jonah said, God's going to destroy this city in 40 days. So they had a probation time. And think about it. What is, when a judge gives probation, it is a hope that the person who receives probation will have learned their lesson from what little incarceration, incarceration they got, incarnation. And then never, ever do that crime again or any other crime. But what usually happens? Guys get out on probation and they ain't out two months and they're already killing more people. It's the court being merciful. I can understand that in some cases. God was merciful to Nineveh to not... Give them 30 seconds. But he gave them 40 days. But it didn't take 40 days. And Nineveh immediately. The king. Put on sackcloth and ashes. And commanded that even the horses. Be covered in sackcloth and ashes. As a sign of their repentance. And they repented. And God spared Nineveh. Nineveh was truly saved brothers and sisters i'm telling you you will go through fiery trials you will go through things maybe so horrible that it'll make you wonder does god really is there really a god does he really care for me is he does he really love me and understand, you can say, God, I don't think I've done anything wrong. Well, that's just the point. He's not testing whether you're going to do right or wrong. He's testing your faith. Do you trust him? And like I said, as it was in the days of Noah... So shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. And there was 40 days of rain, night, and day on the earth. And I believe it's very possible we might go through something very similar to that. Would you last 40 days? Only if God held you up. And if you're right with him, you have nothing to worry about. 
lot of people think you should buy up a lot of food, store up this, store up that, hide it, do whatever. I, I'm not saying that's a bad idea. I really am not. But I think when it comes down to it, I think God's going to feed us. And God's going to take care of us and make sure that we have what we need. If we don't have it, God will do it for us. Amen.